Question for you. How many of y'all know someone you would consider is a proud or even an arrogant person? How many of y'all know someone like that? A lot of hands going up all over the place. Here's another question. How many of y'all know someone who thinks that he or she is very humble, but actually they're full of themselves? All right, a lot, of, lot more hands are going up. Here's the third question. How many of you would consider yourself to be a humble person? Very good. In the last service, automatically they were like, and then, then it was just quick down. That was a trick question. Think about it. What we do is we consider ourselves humble and somebody else proud and arrogant, don't we? Someone else has the problem, we don't. And it kind of reminds me of that old joke where they gave this man the badge of humility for being humble, but they had to take it away because he put it on. (laughs) When we talk about humility, the standard is not me, definitely not me. The standard is not someone here, someone there, or your old Sunday school teacher, or someone who always walks like this, and oh, forgive me for living. That is not humility. If you want to know the standard of humility, look to the cross. Look to Jesus. Not just Jesus serving and helping people, or even washing the feet of the disciples, but look to Jesus dying on the cross Paying the ultimate sacrifice, which is a slave's death. Humility is Christ. And this morning, that's our message in our series called Mind Reset from Philippians chapter 2. And today's message is called Humility. He is our standard. And so when we come to Him, go to the cross, because that's where you find what humility is like. And it should transform you in how you treat people now. Because he who had it all gave it up and paid the ultimate price, the death of a slave on the cross. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. And this morning, I'm going to actually read this passage from Philippi. Philippi is the place where Paul sent this letter. And to give you a little background, I'll be standing on the old pulpit of this ancient basilica at the site of ancient Philippi, more than likely, more than likely, not know for sure, this letter was read for the very first time from this spot. So let's all stand together, Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, and let's turn our attention to the screen. Philippians Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. More than likely, the people in this church heard these words from Paul. And that's where we are in Philippi, Greece. Do you understand what it means to be humble? Are you a humble person? Do you have the heart of Christ? Not just the heart of the one who fed the 5,000 or the one who washed the feet of the disciple, but the heart of the slave who paid with his blood on the cross. And this morning, if you've never come to Christ, you have to humble yourself and come to the cross and see the Savior giving His life for you and ask Him to come into your life and save you and to take over. And as I pray for God's blessing on this message, you pray and invite Jesus to change your life, to come into your life and to transform you. Amen? Would you bow your heads? Father, we thank you this morning once again for the reminder that it's at the cross, at the cross, uh, that our life has been changed forever. 
And God, we pray that each of us who has been to that cross before, Lord, help us to return there and see our Savior dying that gruesome, shameful death of a slave, the ultimate death of a slave. And God, let that radically change us. Many of us are living in pride and arrogance and bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. God, let this message today transform our hearts. And for those who have never been to the cross, Holy Spirit, in the way only you can, bring them to the cross where Jesus died. And God, we thank you again for this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, let everyone say, Amen. You may be seated. Now, last weekend we learned that Jesus chose to come into this world as a doulos, as a slave. That word doulos means slave, not just servant. If Paul wanted to use the word servant, he would have used the word pais. But he uses that word doulos, which specifically means slave. Now, it didn't, doesn't mean that he stopped being God. It does not mean that he gave up his divine attributes. What it does mean is that he gave up by taking on the form of a slave. It's a kind of uh, oddity that he gave up by taking up the form of a slave. I mean, listen again to verse 8. In Philippians, it says, uh, verse 7, it says, But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. He became a slave for us. And something else in verse 8, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. You see, the marks of a slave were humility and obedience. Humble and obedient is what Jesus was. Everywhere he went, he served people. He he fed people. He healed people. He he taught them the words of life. And he washed the feet of his disciples. His ministry was marked by humility and obedience. And then you know his call. What was his call? In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, it says, Come to me, all you who labor, and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. It it, it is a call for us to come to Christ, the slave, and give our burdens over to him. And what will he do? Listen to the next verse, verse 9. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This morning, you may be carrying burdens that are too heavy for you to bear. It may be the burden of sin. It may be a burden of bad decisions. It may be a burden of guilt, of resentment, of unforgiveness. It may be a burden of future fears and doubts and worries. Come to Jesus. What he will do is he will take that burden off your shoulders and he will give you his yoke and his burden, which is easy and light. What he's saying is, give me your worries, your struggles, and then go do what I came to do, which is what? To seek and to save that which was lost. Go tell the world that I have come. Let that be your yoke and I'll handle your problems. And this morning... If you are carrying those burdens today, I I beg you to come to Christ and exchange that burden. Let him take your grief. Let him take your sorrow. Let him take your worries and fears and doubts. Maybe it's a burden today that you have about someone in your life. Uh, They're lost. They don't know Christ. And you're, you're praying for them. You are burdened. You fear about their future. Hey, listen. As I'm pre- preaching to you, you give that person over to Christ. You say, Christ, would you reach out? Would you touch that life? And you change them, because I can't. So, Jesus came to serve by exchanging our burdens for His. But there is much more that He came to do. Go back to verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death. Now listen to this. Even the death of the cross. What is the death of the cross? Why is it so important that it was not just a death, 
by beheading or a death by burning or a death by hanging. It had to be a death of the cross. Why is that important? Now pay attention. Because the death of the cross was the slave's ultimate punishment. The ultimate punishment. It is known as a servile supplicium, means the slave's ultimate punishment. When we think about the cross, we have a very poor understanding of what the cross really means. In fact, last night after our message, Saturday evening, a lady walked out and said, I, I never thought that's what it meant. I thought just a few people were crucified. I didn't know what the cross or the crucifixion was all about. This morning, for the first few moments, we're going to try to understand what the cross truly meant. Several things. The first thing is, the cross or the crucifixion was widespread in the ancient world. Widespread. Sometimes we think only the Romans practiced crucifixion. Not true. And if you grew up in church and Sunday school, and you probably heard me say this too, that it's probably the Persians who invented crucifixion, and that may be true, but I believe we have hints in ancient sources that lots of people practiced crucifixion. For example, in ancient culture like my own, Indians had crucifixion. Not the Indians in North America, the Indians on the other side of the planet. The Assyrians what we call today's modern-day Turkey, that part of the world, they had crucifixion. The Scythians, who are the Scythians? If you look at the map of Europe and look at places like Ukraine, southern Russia, Kazakhstan, this part of Central Asia, these people had crucifixion. Who else had crucifixion? The Greeks. I mean, we know about the Greeks being, you know, philosophers and uh, they cared about human dignity and democracy and freedom. Guess what? They practiced crucifixion. Alexander the Great, at one time, he had as many as 2,000 people crucified because they dared to rebel against him. So the Greeks had no problem crucifying people. The Carthaginians... Northern Africa, which is modern-day Tunisia, that part of the world, they practice crucifixion. Ancient Phoenicians practice crucifixion. And more than likely, historians tell us that the Romans learned about crucifixion probably from these Carthaginians. And by the way, it's not just men who were crucified. Men and wo uh, women, who were, uh, women were also crucified. Probably more men than, than women. So crucifixion was widespread. In fact, if you were to get into a time machine and go back and, and go to any part of the world at the time and say, hey, Jesus was crucified, they wouldn't be like, well, what's the cross? They would know what you were talking about. And the cross may not have looked like this. It may have looked like this. It may have looked like this, but it doesn't matter. They had this thing of nailing someone to a tree or to a plank for the punishment of their crime. What else do we know about crucifixion? Not only was it widespread, but typically among the Romans, it was meted out to the lowest part of society, especially the slaves. Romans did not crucify their own citizens. I mean, that's just, now, beheading, yeah, you could be beheaded, but not Crucified. Crucifixion was just so heinous, so gruesome. So typically, this, this uh, punishment of crucifixion was reserved for the lower parts of society. Slaves, uh, rebels, uh, even in, in some parts of the world, free people, but not Romans, could be crucified. But especially slaves. Slaves. What could a slave get crucified for? Well, let's say you have slaves and you are the master, but you cannot control your slaves. And this has happened again and again, and they're doing things wrong. Guess what uh, the um, Roman government may do? They will step in and say, oh, we got to crucify him or her. So if you are unable to keep your slaves in check, that slave could be crucified by the Romans. Who else? Well, 
uh, Rome, uh, slaves were not allowed to carry weapons. So if a slave was caught with weapons, he could be or she could be crucified. Uh, it happened, there's a story where um, this shepherd who was a slave killed a bear that attacked him. Now you would say that's justified, right? If a bear attacks you, you're justified to defend yourself. He defended himself. Guess what they did to him? They crucified him. Why? Because how dare you have weapons? I mean, nobody <laughs> said, hey, you protected your sheep, you protected yourself. That's, you know, that's an exception. No. Nope. Crucified. Because he had weapons. And many times there were mass crucifixions. If you remember last weekend, we talked about how Spartacus, and uh, very quickly, slaves were not necessarily all from Africa. Sometimes we think that because of our own American history. But slaves could be from Europe. Slaves could be from Asia. In fact, Spartacus was probably of Germanic European descent. In fact, he was from Thrace. And how many slaves were crucified? The general, Roman general Crassus crucified 6,000 slaves all across, all uh, on, on that Apian way leading to Rome on either side. You can just imagine this, this, this line of crucified slaves as you enter into Rome. 6,000. But slaves were the primary candidates to be crucified under the Romans. Something else, how about crucifixion, is that it was very effective. Very effective. For several reasons. It was effective because, well, it satisfied the human thirst for revenge. Let's say you have a slave who rebelled against you. And the Romans have stepped in, and now that slave is going to be crucified. You're going to be there. Now, in our day today, if someone is being given the death penalty, it's usually, you know, in a back room, and you may be able to come with your family and sit, but there's a glass window you can look through if you want to or whatever. You know, it's a very different thing. But back in those days, a slave was crucified in open, and the masters were there. And you could do whatever you want to to the slave before he is crucified. You can torture him, get him scourged, flogged, beat him to the inch of his life, and then nailed him to the cross. It was the human thirst, and, and one ancient writer called it resentful rage. I mean, you're so mad for what he did. And maybe he even hurt one of your family members as he left, or maybe he stole all your money. So you pour all your anger on that person. And then you watch him writhe in pain, and you said, that's right, you deserve that. I mean, that's a human uh, thirst for revenge. So it satisfied that. So it was very effective. What else? Well, it definitely put an end to that life. So that slave or that person or that rebel could not do it again because he is now going to die. So in that other sense, it was also effective because it ended that person. But a third reason, which I believe is the major reason why it was very effective, is because... As I mentioned to you, slaves were not crucified in someone's backyard. They were crucified out in the open. Typically on a crossroads. Imagine coming to a stoplight, a major stoplight downtown, and seeing a line of crosses. That's how it would be. So people walking by could see these criminals... And watch them dying. And it was very effective. Next time you think about stealing horses, that's what happens to horse thieves. Don't do it. And so, very effective. Think about Jesus. Uh, how was Jesus crucified? He was crucified on a hill. And the hill was called Golgotha, which is skull in Hebrew, and in Aramaic, or and in Latin, we call it Calvary, which is pretty much the same thing. Uh, it is skull. Means, uh, why was it skull? Not because the hill looked like a skull. Because probably there were a lot of skulls there. A lot of crucifixions took place. And Hebrews tells us that this uh, crucifixion probably, or not probably, really took place outside the gates of the city. 
by the road so people who were walking by, they, they could see Jesus on the cross and many of them were wagging their heads and saying, <laughs> there, there you are, look at you. you. You said you're going to destroy the temple and raise it up on the third day. Why don't you save yourself and come down from the cross? So while you're hanging on the cross, people were taunting you. So not only you have been beaten to an inch of your life, you are hanging on the cross, people are taunting you. That is what crucifixion was all about. So it was very effective because you don't want to be there. And did the slaves get a funeral? Did the people who were um, crucified, did they get a burial? Of course not. The victims were never buried. The scavengers would typically come and eat the corpses, and the corpse would rot. I mean, that's, that's the end. So day after day, you're walking past the crosses, which are widespread all over, not just in Jerusalem, but in Rome, um, Alexandria, all over the parts of, of the world. At the time, you could see these crosses and criminals, especially slaves, dying the worst form of death, humiliation, and dishonor. But something else. How did the Romans see crucifixion? It was shameful. Very shameful. For you to die on the cross, worst way to die. It is... is... Did you know that when I was studying for this message... Hardly any ancient writer describes how crucifixion actually took place. They didn't, they didn't talk about it. They don't. It's, it's a subject that was just, people were crucified, end of story. Did you know the Bible, the Gospels are the only account of details about nailing to the cross and hanging on the cross and asking for water? I mean, that's... Really coming straight from the Gospels. Other writers talk about the cross, but it's only simply 100 were crucified, 30 were crucified, 6,000 were crucified. They did not lo- like to talk about it because it was so shameful. And many of the ancient writers, they even admitted that this is barbaric. That's horrible. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? But it's got to be done. We don't do it. Guess what these criminals will do? They will do what they did before. Eh, Let's not talk. It is not a subject you would bring up on a dinner table. I don't know if y'all have those subjects don't bring up on the dinner table. Yeah, especially things about body odors. We don't talk about a dinner table, right? If you have boys in your home, let's, let's not talk about that. Crucifixion. If you want to destroy a conversation... Hey, did y'all see the crosses? Uh, no, uh, don't, don't bring that up. It's just not polite talk. That's like you're talking about septic tank. In a restaurant. As you're eating your food. It's like, no. The people in Philippi to whom Paul is writing this letter, when he says he humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross, uh, immediately the emotions clicked on. It was a shameful, horrible, heinous death. How did the Jewish people see the cross? Well, to them, it was not just shameful, but it was accursed. By the way, did you know that Jewish people also crucified their criminals? You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not true. I mean, when you read the Bible, uh, the Jewish leaders are going to Pilate and they're going to Herod. The reason they're going to them is because Rome is ruling Palestine. Prior to that, they crucified people. The Hasmonean kings, the Jewish kings, they crucified. In fact, there was one who crucified as many as 800. And they were Pharisees because the Hasmoneans more were Sadducees. So they crucified 800 Pharisees at one time. Sorcerers, witchcraft, they would crucify them. So when we think about crucifixion, we think, man, this is just a Roman thing that they got from the Persians. We have a very meager understanding 
crucifixion was widespread, very effective, uh, it was shameful, and it was considered accursed because why? Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 21, starting in verse 22. Listen to what the Bible says. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, God is speaking these words, and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree. By the way, hanging someone on a tree, when the Bible says that, it's really crucifixion. Because there is much evidence that hanging someone on a tree uh, was not after they died or hanging them you know, in a noose. It was really nailing them to the tree and then watching them die. Listen to verse 23. His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. inheritance. And listen to this. For he who is hanged is accursed by God. That word accursed is not curse. Curse is like God is cursing you. You're cursed now. Accursed means God hates it. It is detestable. Romans saw the cross as shameful. The Jewish people saw the cross as person who is cursed and hated by God. Any wonder when Paul is writing to the Corinthians, what does he say? We preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, what is it? Greeks, what it is? Foolishness. So if I were to go to a Greek or a Roman person and say, hey, the Savior of the world has come. Oh, really? Tell us more about him. Well, he came, he did miracles, and then the people took him and crucified him. What? Yeah, crucified him. Oh, I, I, I'm not interested. You know, crucified him for your sins. I, I know what you said, but not interested because that's... We don't like to talk about that. If you went to a Jewish person and said, hey, the Messiah has come as prophesied in the Old Testament, and he came and he served the people and he fulfilled prophecy, and then he was crucified. Crucified. Uh, 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 crucified. You know what crucified means? It means that even God hated that person. Well, you've got to receive him as your Savior. No. Not interested. Not interested. You see, when you would tell people, receive Jesus as your Savior, He died on a cross for your sins, that was the end of discussion. Not interested. That's shameful. We, we, please, don't, let's not talk about that. Why did Jesus choose this horrible slave's death. Because it was God's plan of redemption. Something that God had prophesied and promised in the book of Isaiah 700 years ago. I want us to read those words starting in verse 3 of chapter 53, Isaiah 53. Verse 3, what does it say? He is despised and rejected by men despised. When you see someone on a cross, you don't say, oh, I love you. You know, you're just like, despised, hated, rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And what do we do with him? And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. No one says, oh, wow, there's, a, there's people hanging on the cross. How great is that? No, you would turn your head. 700 years before the coming of Christ, this prophecy was given. That he who is going to come, he is going to die a death that you can't even look at because it is so hideous. We hid it, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. He was despised. He was accursed. But why did he do this? Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, 
smitten by God, and afflicted. So when you're seeing Jesus hanging on the cross, what, what the prophecy is saying is, don't think that this man was doing this and going through this for his own sins. No, he was bearing our griefs. He was stricken because I was supposed to be stricken. Because that's how God sees my sin. He hates it. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Means the nails went into his hands, not for his sins, but for my sins. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. They flogged him before they took him to the cross. But every time they flogged him, you and I were getting healed. It was for me. It was for you. Don't turn your head away. Don't turn your face away. Don't look down. Don't, don't mess with your phones right now. I'm telling you this morning, this is what saves you. This is what's going to transfer you into eternity. If this bothers you, then you are in line of the millions of people who walked away from the cross and said, let's not talk about that. That's too hideous. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It means we were busy wandering away from God. And God was busy coming after us. He was oppressed, verse 7 and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. You know what some of the, the slaves would do as they were crucified, as their master would taunt them and say, that's right, that's what happens when you do this to me. They would spit at him. They would curse him. Isn't that crazy? You're dying on the cross. Uh, he, he would rather be like, oh, I'm so sorry. They would curse him because they know they're going to die anyways. So you hate me, I hate you worse. What did Jesus do from the cross? Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he never opened his mouth. You see, every step of the way, Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. What else happened? He was led as a slam to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. So not just for one person or two people. For all, he was being stricken. Means what he was going through, I was supposed to go through. Because that's how God sees me and my sin. And then verse 9, and they made his grave with the wicked. What does it say there? They made his grave with the wicked, but the rich at his death. A very strange passage. Now, what did I tell you about how they treated the body of the person crucified? Did they give him an honorable burial? No, no. Family doesn't get the body. Because it's, it's, it's going to lose its effect. It's supposed to be effective, and if you take the body down, then it's an empty cross. That's just half the punishment. The full punishment is people have to see it so they learn their lesson. And people would hang there on the cross for six to eight days. How long did Jesus hang on the cross? Just six hours. Just six hours. At the end of that... Two men, Jewish men, came. One was Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible says he was a rich man. He was part of the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was the highest Jewish council made up of 71 some uh, leaders. The high priest was the chairman and the chief priest was there and the Jewish leaders. And two men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, were part of that council. And Joseph comes to Pilate and says, can I please get the body of this man? And Pilate says, fine, take it. And what does Joseph do with his body? 
He puts it in his own tomb that was never used. And by the way, he was a rich man. Nicodemus, also part of the Sanhedrin, who did not agree with the crucifixion, he did not agree with the kangaroo cord and said, that is wrong what you're doing for this man. He does not deserve that death. Nicodemus came too. Remember he came at night and Jesus told him, unless you're born again. But he came at his death with aloes and myrrh to anoint the body of Jesus. Two rich men showed up. Why? Because, go back to verse 9. What does the Bible say? And they made his grave with the wicked. Means they were, they were getting him ready to give him a slave's end. But the rich at his death. Why? Why didn't Jesus continue hanging on the cross until the scavenging birds and animals ate him up? Because even though he was slave, yet he was also the king of the world. He was hanging on the cross not for his own sins, but for your sins and mine. And he did not deserve to rot on that cross. He deserved a royal burial. Because he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So, what was considered accursed among the Jewish people, two leaders from their Sanhedrin came. And they believed that he was the son of God. How about the two men who were hanging on either side of Jesus? There were two thieves, remember that? One on the right, one on the left. And one was mocking Jesus. I mean, how, how depraved can you get? I mean, you're hanging over there. You're going to die. How much do you care about this man over here? But he's mocking him. And the guy on the other side of Jesus said, hey, stop it, man. Come on. We're here because we deserve this. This man did not do anything. And then he asked Jesus something. What did he ask him? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And in the midst of his suffering, and not just physical suffering, the sin of the entire human race is poured upon Jesus. What did Jesus say to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. A slave got saved. We know those two Jewish men were saved, of course. I mean, why would you come? Slaves got saved. But who else was standing by the cross? Who else was standing by the cross? A Roman centurion who watched this whole thing happen and how Jesus died. And what does he say? Surely this man must be the Son of God. What's the point of all this? It's something about the cross. There's something about that cross. It doesn't matter whether you are a Jewish person. It doesn't matter if you are a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're a slave deserving of your death penalty. There's something about the cross that draws us to Christ. Folks, just, just know one thing. We do all this over here, lights and videos and and all this other stuff we do. We, we're, please listen. Please listen. We're not doing this because the cross needs help. The cross is fine without any of this. We, we do all this because he deserves our best. Are you all with me? So don't you walk away thinking, oh, they're trying to do all this stuff to kind of attract people. No. We do this because he gave his ultimate sacrifice. But the cross needs no help. It has an amazing power to draw people. Did you know this is the third message today? Last night, a person got saved. I prayed with him. Family been praying 20-some years. Right after the first service this morning, 9.30, a lady came to me with tears. Can you please pray with me so I can get saved? That doesn't need my help. It is the greatest magnet in the world. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. But you get a glimpse of what the cross is all about. It will change your life. Or are you going to walk away going, it's foolishness. 
It will change your life. What did Paul say? Again, in Corinthians, Paul says, When I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God because I had already decided I will know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We began this message talking about humility. If you want to be humble... Don't, don't, don't hold someone up as your example. Hold Christ on the cross as your standard. He died a slave's death that he didn't have to die so that you and I could go free. He gave the ultimate sacrifice. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Before you go out and start saying who is arrogant and who is proud, you examine your heart and say, does it match up with that? We're so quick to say he is arrogant and he is full of himself and she is so, she thinks she's all that. Really? The standard is Christ on the cross. Where do you match up? If you're not forgiving someone in your life, that's pride. If you're resentful, that's pride. If it all is about you and everybody has to rotate and, and, and circle you and it's about your needs and it's about your post and it's about you, 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 that's pride, folks. He gave it all up so you and I could go free. And this morning, what needs to happen is for you to come and say, God, I lay it all down. At the foot of the cross, you cannot stand erect. You have to bow. You have to humble yourself. And for those of you who have never received Jesus as your Savior, one day, you're going to meet Him, but He's not going to be a slave dying a slave's ultimate death. He is going to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. You will. Except you can be saved now. Getting saved happens here. If you've never done that, you come. You give your life to Christ. And ask Him to forgive you of your sins because He has earned the right to forgive because He paid the price. It's time to leave your hang-ups behind. And hold on to Christ. You say, well, but I grew up thinking this, or I, I heard this, and I don't know what someone you highly esteem in your life told you about Christianity, and the message like this is that's just what con conservatives preach, and that's what just fundamentalists preach, and that's just what Baptists say. Folks, this is the gospel. If you don't believe this, you will die in your sins forever and ever and ever. And God is calling you Leave all behind and come. Because that's the standard. 